I'm going to speak tonight. We're in a new series uh, called Into the Light, and, uh, and so, um, so expectant. And one of the verses that we can, you can read about around Into the Light is, uh, is when the Bible talks about that when we, are, when we come to Jesus, when we give our lives to Him, when we surrender our lives to Him, in that process, this actually incredible thing happens. It says that we are brought out of the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of this world, and we are actually transported into the kingdom of God or the kingdom of light. And now in this place, actually every part of my life is, is according to this kingdom. I live my life now according to this kingdom and the way of this kingdom, not the way of the world, but this kingdom, right? And including our relationships. And tonight I'm gonna talk about relationships, about community, and, and, and more uh, poignantly, uh, big word, babe, does that get me points? Poignantly, I'm gonna talk about unity. And I've titled my message, Unity from Possible to tangible. Because unity is not just something that's possible. Unity is actually something that should be tangible. It's been made possible, but it's up to us to make it tangible in our life. And I believe that God is moving, and, and we're going to have a chance at the end of this message to, to respond and have, have a moment as well. But I believe that there's, you know, because this is, this is like the world we live in, kind of, and, and because of we're human and we're not perfect, we can actually um, come, into, and, and come into this place, maybe, or watch online, and, and our relationships, there might be drama going on. There might be a grudge that we've been holding. There might be some bitterness or unforgiveness, right, in our life. But I believe that God is going to move tonight and that an exchange can take place. Come on, because we're not, we're not called to hold on to that, and I believe that an exchange could take place. That maybe there has been something that you've been holding on to, and it's like, it, it kind of feels natural now, and it's become such a part of your life, but the Holy Spirit is here tonight to, for an exchange to take place, because instead of that drama, instead of the bitterness, instead of unforgiveness, that forgiveness could flow, that love could flow, that patience could flow, right, that peace could flow, and that we would actually find unity. And so I'm going to unpack Psalm 133. It's just three verses long, and we're going to unpack each section of it tonight. And, um, and it starts this way. It starts um, in verse 1. It says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. We could all agree, right? It's good and pleasant when people can get along. <laughs> it's like, it's good and pleasant when my, my two-year-old son can, can get along uh, with, with people. Like, he doesn't have any brothers and, or sisters, um, but he has cousins. And, uh, and uh, even yesterday, I was reminded of this fact, and I was kind of thinking of this verse. Like, I was more saying how good and pleasant it would be if uh, they could dwell in the same room, inhabit the same space together. But uh, at two years old, it, it doesn't seem, Beck and I, we're actually going to be married seven years tomorrow. Hey, is that? Did I get that right? Seven years? Yeah, <laughs> I remember. And uh, and um, but it's it's like we can kind of think, oh yeah, kids are like that, right? Like two year olds, this is like that, you know. It's like Leo's playing happily with a toy, and then his cousin happens to pick up a toy, and Leo's attention is like, oh, that's the only toy I've ever wanted. I've always wanted it. It's the only tool I ever want. It, I love it. It's my favorite one. I need it and give it to me. And it's just this, this fight ensues. And then sometimes he, he gets it. Although, you know, grandma and granddad have bought Kmart out about three times over, you know, with toys. There's a sea of toys, but it's just that one. And he gets it, he plays with it for a while and then just discards it. But it's actually not something isolated, right, to, to toddlers, Right, This verse is kind of saying it's good and pleasant when we can dwell together because sometimes, especially after maybe a year like we've had, our society where it's at right now, it seems like we can't inhabit the same space as one another. It's like in our world, it's, like, it's almost like we just can't. It's impossible to inhabit the same space as one another. There's not enough room for, for all of us. It's like that person thinks differently to me. I can't inhabit the same space as them. You did this or you said this in your life. I can't inhabit the same space as you anymore. We used to be friends, but now we're not, right? We, even sometimes our pride, our ego, our jealousy gets in the way, and, and we can't inhabit the same space as each other. It's like it's impossible, right? And we've will we we've got to understand that we will, never, we will never walk into the good and pleasant unity that is actually available to us if we keep living our relationships according to the kingdom of this world. There is a way. The Bible says, because it's so easy, like preparing for this message, vulnerable moment. This week, uh, so many moments came up this week with moments, chances for division, even for me, right? Just like, again, every day there was just a moment where I was like, why is this more intense than ever before? But we're all 
right? We, we, we know there's multiple times a day where there's a moment, an opportunity for division, for something to separate us, right? This verse is saying uh, how good and pleasant it is when we can dwell together. But if, we're, if we continue to live our lives according to the pattern of this world, and it's easy to do because Romans says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, which means it's possible. But, but so we, if we're going to keep doing it that way, we're, we're not going to actually inherit the, the unity, the good and pleasant unity that God has for us. But if we will, if we will go, I'm, I'm going to live my life according to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light, we can actually experience good and pleasant unity. And we're going to unpack that, unpack that a little bit more tonight. But we've got to check ourselves. We've got to check ourselves all the time. If, if we are canceling people because they think differently to us, come on. We're going to go there. If we're speaking behind someone's back, if we're gossiping, if we're tearing people down, if we're talking ill of people, if our first instinct is to get angry at somebody and give them a mouthful and give them our mind, a piece of our mind, if we are, if we are not yet continually forgiving again and again and again and again those people that might offend us or might do things, we are not yet living our lives according to the kingdom of God. We are not yet doing our relationships according to the kingdom of light. This is what the Bible says. But there is hope. I don't say that to be like, oh, wow, I feel so down about everything. Now, there is hope, right? There is hope. And that's the first thing. First point tonight is unity is possible. I don't, I, I don't have time. I'm going I'm to cancel the thought tonight that unity is not possible because it is possible. The Word of God says unity is possible. This verse is saying how good and pleasant it is when. It doesn't say what I was trying to say the other day when the cousins weren't getting along. It doesn't say how good and pleasant it would be if you could. It says how good and pleasant when. It's possible. There is a place where we can dwell in unity, and that place is the kingdom of God. If we will live our lives according to the kingdom of God, the pattern of this new kingdom, we can actually live in good and pleasant unity. It is possible. 1 John 1, seven. it says this, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, according to the kingdom of the light, the kingdom of God, we have fellowship with one another. We can have fellowship, c- community, unity with one another if we are living according to the light. If we are living in the light. It's, it's saying it right there. It's, it's possible. And I, I gotta tell you, it's a, it's, a, it's a sneaky lie of the enemy to say you don't actually have to like that person. Or, or interact with them kindly because, you know, you just don't, you're just different. So, like, you don't actually have to, you know, be nice or like that person. That is a sneaky lie that was just used by the enemy to divide the church, to divide friendship, divide people. The Word of God says, what God has put together, let no man tear apart. His church is not meant to be divided. It's a body, right? Bodies don't work when they're all split up and divided. It's meant to be. The body of Christ is united, right? It is possible. So part of, and it's, and it, it's like, when I read this verse for the first time in my life, I was like totally blown away because it's so easy to think that, you know, Jesus and what he did, right? So he came, he was sent because God so loved the world. He sent his son, you know, so that we could have relationship with God. But that was just, that's just half of the story. It says this, read this in Ephesians 2, verse 13 to 16. It says, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Incredible. So his sacrifice upon the cross for you and I allows us to have relationship with God. But that's just half the story. It says, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. Come on, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross and put to death their hostility. Why would we try and resurrect hostility that God has, that Jesus has gone to the cross and paid a price for to die for? It wasn't just your sin that was hanging upon that cross. It's actually hostility towards one another that is hung upon that cross when Jesus was up there. That's half the story to say that I have peace between God. He came to give peace between you and that person beside you. He came to give peace between you and that person that actually thinks differently to you. That is a part. And that's not something I can do in my own strength. That's why Jesus had to come. That's why it's only possible in Jesus to live my life according to the kingdom of God. It's only there that unity is possible. God's people shouldn't be known for their hostility, but their unity. 
Unity is a trademark of the follower of Jesus. Yes, love, yes, kindness, all these things, but unity. Jesus made unity positive and it's possible, and it's not some contrived effort because it's actually impossible for me to do it. It was accomplished by Jesus. It's not up and down. It's not sometimes unity, sometimes not. As abiding as the work on the cross is for my sin, so it is for peace and unity between me and somebody else. Unity is possible, and Jesus, uh, he's made it possible, and it was one of the purposes of Jesus. But why? John 13, 35, it says, by this all people will know that you are my disciples. And anything could have followed that line because you pray real good, because you dress real good, because you go to C3 church. You know, he actually says, this is the way. This is the way that the world will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. If you don't have love for one another, how on earth is the world gonna know that you're my followers, that you are actually a follower of Christ living your life uh, after me? John 17, 20, it almost goes like a step further. Verse 21, we'll we'll pick it up from. This is Jesus praying and he says, I pray that they may all be one. All of my followers, I pray that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that they also may may be, may be, may be in us so that the world may believe that you've sent me. He's praying that, that we would be one so that the world would actually see that and be like, yep, that's a testimony to, the, to the, the reality and the power of God. This is, this is what Jesus is saying. It's so important. Jesus desires his church to be united. So much so that was what, a part of what he accomplished on the cross. He made it possible. Number two is unity ushers in the power and presence of God. We read in verse two. Let's read verse two of Psalm 133. It says, this unity, it says, it's like the precious oil on the head running down the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. I know what you're saying, like who, who's Aaron and why, has he got beard oil? Like what's he trying to do here, right? So Aaron, you might know him from such movies as the Prince of Egypt, anybody, Prince of Egypt? Uh, you might know him from the Bible too, like he's a legit person. And, uh, but he was like Moses' sidekick, right? He, he's helping, he's leading the people with Moses out of Egypt, right? Through the Red Sea, all these incredible miracles. He actually performed some of the miracles for Moses, did a lot of the talking for Moses. Incredible guy. But then you pick it up in Exodus, they're out of Egypt, and now they set up the temple of God, where God was actually gonna dwell with man. Incredible, right? And they create this temple, and, and they were gonna, and, and Aaron and his sons were actually made the priests, so they were the ones that were gonna go into the presence of God. They were gonna make sacrifices. They were gonna, um, on behalf of the people, they were gonna minister before God, gonna do that. But before they went in, they needed to be anointed with oil. And this verse is saying it's like, unity is like the oil running down. He's been anointed to go in. So we need to catch this. That anointing oil, that holy oil, was made up of oil and four different spices. Myrrh, cinnamon, cane, and cassia. So these were different spices that actually mixed together, unified, actually made a holy oil, made way to come before God, right? It's actually unity. It's a picture of unity. It's a picture of very different people coming together and uniting to make something holy. The Bible says that we are his holy people, a chosen priesthood, right? Because we're, why? Because we're unified. And it actually made way for people to come into the presence of God. Jesus picks this up in the New Testament, and he says this in Matthew 5, verse 23. Like, I am gonna bet 50% of the people in this room have never read this verse, because it's just like, it's like, oh wow, that's actually in there. Jesus says this, he says, if you are offering your gift at the altar, so like modern day, you've come to church, you're serving, you've come to church, you're praising and worshiping, you've, you know, you've come to church, you've joined online. If you've done that, and then you remember that your brother has something against you, So something's not right in the relationship. You've done something wrong. You've said the wrong thing. It's just things are not right. He says, he doesn't say keep keep administering your gift, you know, keep doing it. No, he says stop and leave. He says leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come back and offer your gift. Come on, this is how much onus that Jesus put on unity. 
He, he's like, I want you to be, I want, I want your, like you to be united before I have your worship. Like how many of us can come into a room like this, praise and worship God, you know, but we're also tearing somebody down. Right, we're gossiping, we're doing things like that. We can, we can sing about and receive freely the love and forgiveness of God, but we don't give it out. We just cancel people instead. Come on, he's saying, no, 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 I, I need you to be united. That's how important, because unity makes way to come before God. Right, he, it, this is how important he thinks it is, unity. We have to, he wants our unity before he wants our worship. And incredible things happen. Listen to the early church. They were like, that the Bible says they were of one heart and one mind. They were united. And it says these incredible things happen in Acts 4, verse 31. It says, after they prayed, the place where they were was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. That's a pretty incredible moment. What were they doing? They were united, praying together. Verse 32, it says, all of the believers were one in heart and one in mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own but they shared everything they had, and with great power. So because of that, it says, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there was no needy person among them. Incredible power of God moving, incredible miracles of God happening. Why? Not because anyone was really good at prayer. It doesn't say that. Not because of anything. It says because of their unity. They were united. They're of one heart, one mind. This is, this is the power of unity. And the third thing is that unity brings life. We read in verse three, it says, this unity, it says, it's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountain of Zion, for the Lord has commanded the blessing and life forevermore. So it's talking about this dew, and you're like, what? I did my due diligence tonight, and, uh, and I did some research. Wait for it. Does everyone get it? Everyone's caught up. Here's the thing, like you, you can just read something like that in the Bible and go, oh, sweet, it's like do Herman, yeah, okay. But if you actually look into it, re, re, let's read this, well, you can't read it with me, but I'll read it to you. This is actually what this is referring to. It says, the dew of Hermon, which is a mountain, and the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, to which the psalmist referred, differs entirely from the ordinary dew. It's a phenomenon peculiar to Palestine and the East. It is a soft mist that comes from the Mediterranean during the summer when the heat is greatest and the country is burnt up with terrible sunshine. We'll come back to that in a moment. It is attracted by the inland heights and condensed in copious moisture upon their sides, it creeps down upon the plains, reviving and refreshing every green thing. It comes first to the Mount Hermon and helps to keep its unchanging robe of snow, but then it fills its springs, it feeds its cedars, it flows down and makes the corn grow green in the valley, and the vines to swell out their purple grapes in the vineyard, and the lilies to unfold their crimson radiance in the fields. The Bible is saying that this is what unity's like. And you know what I love, I said we'll come back to it. It, This happens when when it's the heat of the summer, it's the most hot. Things are the most intense. Things have been scorched the most. See, even in the midst of when a relationship seems like it could be at its worst, it's at its most scorched. It seems like there's no life. When society is at its most tense, there can still be unity. And when that unity comes, this brings life. If we are unified in here, there'll be life flowing out there. If there is unity in your life, there will be life flowing out of your life. That is how powerful unity is. It, it doesn't just affect you, it affects everything around it. Even when things are the most intense, they can still come, and that's the moment it brings life. It revives things, and if we will pursue unity, it can bring life. It'll revive, it'll refresh, it'll feed, it'll bring life. This is the power of unity. Come on, unity is possible. Jesus has made unity possible. It's actually powerful. It makes, it makes way, it consecrates things. It makes way for us to come into the presence of God. It also brings life to everything around it. It's incredible. But you're saying, so, so, so what do we do? How do we, how, if it's possible, how do we make it tangible? Because that sounds good to me, right? Power, presence of God, life and life to everything around it. That revival, that, that sounds great. But how do we make it from just possible to tangible? Well, I believe we find an answer in Colossians verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 12 to 14. And this is just super practical. And it says this to us. It says, put on then 
as God's chosen ones. I might get the team to come out. Put on then as God's chosen ones. So put this on, I list some things. The first one, compassionate hearts. Put on a compassionate heart. What does that mean? It's like actually care for people. Take an interest. Might mean you have to slow down a little bit. Might mean you have to try and not get so consumed with, with yourself or with what's going on with you and start having your eyes open to see the people around you. Have compassion. Jesus, all his miracles is because he was moved by compassion, the Bible says. Have compassion, number one. Put it on. Put it on like you're putting on your clothes. Put these things on in the morning. Put clothes on in the morning is a by, you know, it's a, a side point there. Put on compassion. Put on kindness. Man, this is one that I have to really focus on. Because I'm like, pull out of a gate. Let's go. But kindness means you have to be soft. You have to soften your approach with people. We just come so hard, so fast at people. The Bible's saying, put on kindness. Take a second. Put on kindness. Be gentle. Be soft. Proverbs is full of incredible things. Project for you over the next 30 days. Read a proverb a day. Proverbs is full of this stuff and incredible ways of doing relationship. Put on kindness. Humility. Wow, pride is one of the biggest things that will get in the way of our relationships. Put on humility. It's, it's thinking about yourself, not thinking, what is it? Think, not thinking about yourself less, but thinking of your, whatever that is. You know what I mean, right? right? Put on humility. Actually put it on. Like, put it on at the start of your day. Be like, I, I don't know everything. I can be wrong. I'm going to say the wrong things. I am not above reproach in that. I am human. We've we kind of got to understand that, right? Put on humility. And then it says put on meekness, which is, meekness is like a submissiveness. But submissiveness, submissiveness is not weakness. When you're submitted, when you're submissive, that means you're coming down low. You're getting low. You get rid of the ego and get low. But from this place, I can lift other people up. It's, it's not coming from a place of meekness. Is, the opposite of meekness is like pride and coming from this, this angle. Like I'm above you. I'm better than you. Meekness, can't, meekness comes low. It's submitted, it's submitted. It's submissive. And it lifts other people up. It honors other people. One of the best things that you can do in your life is honor people, praise people, encourage people. Don't just talk about yourself in a conversation. Talk about how amazing they are. Come on, come meek. And it says, put on patience and bear with one another. You know, in the Bible, someone comes to Jesus and says, how many times should I forgive my brother? Would seven be okay? And Jesus says, how about seven times 70? Which if my maths is correct, if it still hasn't changed, it's 490, right? I don't know if I've actually forgiven some one person 490 times in my life. Like that's a lot, but that's not what he's getting at, right? Like that would be, a, that would be an achievement anyway if you could forgive somebody. My wife's probably forgiven me 490 times, but it's saying it's this continual thing. Be patient. Bear with one another. We're going to do the wrong thing. We're going to mess up. Someone's going to offend you. Someone's going to say something. Something's going to happen. But be patient with one another. Bear with one another. And then it says, if someone has a complaint against you, post about it on Instagram. Nope. If someone has a complaint against you, go talk about it with all your other friends. Nope. If someone has a complaint against you, forgive them. Wow. That's a challenge. If, if you have a complaint against somebody, forgive them. Because it says, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, so summarizing all of those, above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. But how do I put these things on? How do I put on love? Because this is, this is so important that we understand this or else it'll always just be possible, but never tangible in my life and never tangible in my relationships. How do I put it on? The only way I think that we can actually put on that love is by remembering and living out of a place of Jesus' love for me. Because we super quickly forget that we used to hold some different opinions to God at one certain point, but He still loved us. We, we did some things that flew in His face, that, offend, that offended Him, that missed the mark, but He still loved us. Sometimes we did some things that God had every right to be angry about, or maybe we were angry at Him, but He still loved us. When I live out of that place, the Bible says that we love because He first loved 
us, right? And when I'm living out of this place, this revelation, this understanding of His love for me, it's then that I can be, I'm gonna, it's, that, it's that process that I can put on compassion. I can put on kindness because I've experienced it, because I've experienced His compassion for me. I've experienced His kindness. I've experienced His humility, His meekness. Jesus, well, he, he, he modeled for us everything. He doesn't expect us to do anything that He didn't do. He modeled each and every one of these. And I love Romans 5 verse 8. It says, God demonstrates His own love for us that while we were still sinners, while we were still missing the mark, whilst we were still running the other way, He sent His Son and Christ died for us. Wow, He laid down His life. That is love. The the Bible says that no greater love has somebody than this, that they lay down their life for their friends, which is exactly what Jesus did. This is how we can move unity, and it's possible. Come on, we're not living our life according to the kingdom of this world. We're living according to the kingdom of God. And in this kingdom, unity is possible. Despite differences, unity is possible. Despite background, unity is is possible, right? It's possible. He's made it possible. It's powerful. It brings life. But we need to move from possible to tangible, and we need to put it on. We put on love and do that by remembering His love towards you.